Now, unfortunately, on the last tape, one of the things we try to not have happen at all, but it does happen, is we weren't watching the camera. We were putting pins in this rudder and putting one side of it on with Elmer's glue and wound up running out of tape. So this is basically going to have to dry overnight. We wound up, just to continue where we were, we Elmer's glued on one of the sides. We made the sides from wing skins. Very simple framework. I'm going to let it dry. I'm not sure if I'm happy with it yet, but if I'm not, I can always make it a little bit thinner, a little bit thicker. I can do more tapering. Or I can just make it at a solid quarter-inch sheet. I wanted to see how this was going to work, just to see if, uh, well, if the weight's going to be what we want and if the, the look is going to have the look that I want. See, the thickness in this is now just a little under a half an inch once it's radiused and rounded off. And I didn't know if I was going to like that look because we're basically looking at the V in the tail as a half an inch and I didn't want this to look too thin or too thick. I won't really know until I sand and carve it up, but it's a very easy part to make. It only takes a couple hours to make it, so if it doesn't work out, it's not a big deal. We'll give that one to Mike and just make up another one. Well, our silver parts are sitting over here under a heating vent, drying up, including the wing. We've been working on a little bit every day, trying to touch up little spots, make this as, as nice of a finish as we possibly can. The silver that we did, we have sanded this out several times. It's got what I think is just a dry coat on here. It's just a little bit dry. And I'm going to hope that that's going to be just enough because we're going to, on top of that, put a coat of B25 silver. We don't ha In other words, we don't have to have this be the final shiny coat. It just needs to be a blocker coat, and I think we have enough on there. I'm going to hopefully be able to get a nice coat of that B25 silver over this and it is really going to sparkle. That's one of the things that I really liked about the B25 model was the final color of silver. It has that little pearl tint to it like the Mercedes and the BMWs do. And that color I think was one of the things that helped to make that a, a concourse winning model. But anyway, we're going to get back to that rudder tomorrow. Tonight, it's what we do every night. Go run the trains and relax and get rested up for tomorrow. Now I'm sure all the subscribers remember the great trip we had to Warren Walker's, the photos he took of the uh, the ride he had in the, the Mustang. Hey, we were really, really excited about seeing that. But something even more important, we were out there. He gave us, we, we stayed at his house, and he made us Ebel Skeebers. And if you've never had Ebel Skeebers, well, Karen is making her first batch today. So this is the first time you're making these, huh, Karen? Yeah. The pan, we actually got this pan from, this is the one Warren gave us? Yes, it is. We smuggled this back on the airline. Let's see what's involved in making Ebel Skeebers here. Mm. Oh, you missed all the fun. I already did all the work. Well, you're... It's like air epoxy light. Same consistency. Okay, let's see you make this happen. Oh, you're in my light. I'm in the wall. I would make one at a time until you get... No, you can't make one at a time. Oh, oh, here we go. When do you chef? Actually, when you do, you take little chopsticks and turn them. Is that how he did this? Mm -hmm. Warren, I don't know if she was paying attention. I was. Too much dough in there. Maybe I did. Well, it says, we'll find it out. It says to fill it up to the top, and I filled it to the top. But that's if you're Warren, you know, if you know how to do this. Well, let's see. Nah, 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 not yet, not yet. The idea is when you get these, they're cooking, and Warren had his chopsticks, he was twisting them and spinning them, and... Well, I'm your and I don't know. Well, if we burn them, the birds are going to get evil skeevers instead of windy. And this is what our first evil skeevers look like. They, they actually are bird food. But, 
thanks to windy technology, we figured it out. <laughs> We've wasted twenty dollars worth of evil scheme. No, here's the problem. This is an electric stove. It gets very hot. The direction. I think you need a little bit more hardener in this air epoxy. The right. directions say to, to put it on a medium high flame. That's Come on. That's why they burn. Turn that one with the chopstick. Where's the chopsticks? You got to get the chopsticks in here and turn it. It's not ready to be turned. It's not ready. It's ready. No, it's not. There, ready. look, it's an evil skeever. See that? It is not. Leave it. It's not ready. Darren, I'm afraid we're not opening a restaurant. Excuse me, but, but anyway. You are not the cook. I am. Mine look better than yours. Yours are just not burnt. That's an evil skeever? That. Warren, I'm embarrassed that I'm better than she. Ah, ah, she steals you my evil. You have to wait skeeter. till it gets brown. Okay, well, move, make it move. It's gonna stick. No, it's not gonna. Stick. Warren was moving these all around when he made them. Yeah, he was doing that all the time. There you go. And they look like. Look at that. We're making evil skeevers. We're making. They look like little golf balls. Not, not and make sure they're not raw. Not done. Warren, who do you trust? All right, here we go. I'm afraid to turn the camera on. And don't fill it all the way. That was part of the trick, too. See, everything is high technology here. Make two at a time, or three at a time, or something. But if you make ten, it's a problem. Or how many are in there, it's a problem. Actually, even these burned ones don't taste that bad. They just burn. Okay. Now I waited a minute and a half and then started turning it. No, you did not. You waited more than two minutes. Mm. Look at how that took, look, it comes like a little golf ball. It's called an evil skeever. This is Karen's evil skeevers. This is Wendy's no, evil skeevers. No, they are not. <laughs> <laughs> the best one right here, Warren. This is my best, oh, it just was my best one. Now Warren was moving these around while oh, we were I'll doing move it. it. Moving it. Keep it moving. Keep it moving. It's, it's all got a hole in the middle. Oh, God. This one is just disaster. Ah, ah, that's mine. I'll take that one. That one has Chicky written all over it. Please. <coughs> we never erase the video. When we fail at something, we fail big time. Oh, man. Really? Yeah, we do two or three of them here. But the first time you do anything, it's going to be like this. Yeah, this is, this is like electric stove is difficult. You have to know how to do it. See, you got the right amount of batter in those. That looks like the right amount of batter. Okay, this one has to stay a little more here. I'm getting hungry. We've been doing this for an hour I already. Serve this As a test, we put a couple of the burnt evil skeevers out in our bird feeder. I noticed we don't have any birds here this morning. This is why you should always use Brodac, patented Brodac Evil Skeever mix. That one's good. That's a good one. See, that's what Warren was doing, is spinning them around like that. There's some spots that in there. Yeah. I'm proud of you, baby. Getting hungry, though. Now, we usually count a Sunday breakfast as a special time. We sit and take all our pills. We have our gourmet coffee. And people don't realize I'm a gourmet cook. Oh, please. Oh. God. God, if I'm lying, I'm dying. Ah, I'm having a heart attack. And we have the paper, and our Javalia coffee, and evil skeevers. Notice not one bird is at the feeder. I can't believe this. Usually by now we have a thousand birds out there. They're boycotting us. We read about these evil skeevers in, uh, in stunt news. Well, here they are in real life, but I'll tell you, it's going to be a hard sell to the birds. I think the word's gone out in the bird network that the don't even go to Wendy's feeder this morning. See, that's what he was doing. He was, there you go. Just flipping them over like that. Oh, man. I am so proud of you, Karen. We're going to give you the Walker Evil Skeever Cup. You can be on the F2B Evil Skeever team. Yes, sure. Except, except my birds don't like Evil Skeevers. What's oh, going on here? Oh no, what they did, one fell in the driveway. They were all going down on a driveway and eating it. I couldn't fit them all in there. Those are the Danish birds. The Danish birds. <coughs> Breakfast with Wendy and Karen, what a treat. I'm sure Buzz Brodak is as jealous as could be that she doesn't have evil skeevers. 
sports you can learn from a windy video. Oh, show more and look at this one. If you can't, okay, I got it on the. Look. If if you can't make award-winning bombers, at least you can make. Uh, make evil skeevers. You can make evil skeevers. This is going to be a memorable, a memorable Sunday morning breakfast. Look at this go. Look at this action. Look hey, at this. Hey, they good. They good. Have three good ones. All right. Notice one evil skeever fell in the driveway. That's the birds are boycotting me this morning. I don't have any birds. I have a, I have a lonesome evil skeever here. This is the whole thing with anything in life. You got to learn. You got to experiment. You got to you got to get the evil skeever video. Open that up for me quickly. Oh, look at those evil skeevers! Oh, Warren, eat your heart out. Making me hungry just looking at that bacon. Hmm, I think I'll reach over and steal, steal a slice. Hmm. If anybody doesn't live in our area of the country, we have a terrible problem with Canada geese. There's millions and millions of them that we can never get rid of them. They poop on everything. I just figured out a great way we could patent this idea of how to get rid of Canada geese, Karen. Give them our first batch of the evil skeevers. You get windy to make the evil skeevers. You throw them out in the parking lot. You never see another Canada goose for the rest of the season. They go back to Canada. Put the camera on. Uh, put the camera on. The camera's always on. This little hard as a rock one is Wendy's. The rest of them are mine. Oh, she's rubbing it in. Oh, God, she's rubbing it in. Look at this. Why don't I just want you to know? These are really good. These are great. We're actually using Warren's plate. And you think you, all you're going to learn from a windy video is uh, how to make a crooked wing or something. That's not true. You can make concourse winning evil skeevers. <coughs> you know how some of the competitors' videos would show a guy coming out in a white suit with a baker's hat and say, we're going to make evil skeevers today. We never make a bad evil skeever. Well, not on windy videos. We show the bad ones, the good ones. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah, they're How's that one? You read some ugly ones. You don't look that ugly to me. But only the one I made looks ugly. The yeah, rest looks pretty the rest good. They're really a hard sell to the birds, though. The birds, are, they're not even at the feeder this no, morning. We'll give them some of the good ones. Karen prefers hers with jelly. I like them with syrup. Mmm. Mmm. Maybe when we're at Brodax, instead of giving a finishing demo, we'll give an evil skeever demo. See what Buzz says about Warren that. Warren has to come to do it. <laughs> if Warren comes, bring the evil... Warren, if you come to Brodak, bring the evil skeever pan. Evil skeevers by Warren Walker. Anyway, we have Warren Walker's picture, all pictures all over our shop here, in places of honor, but... Believe me, he'll be go he'll be best known here for delicious evil skeevers and for keeping a Canada geese out of our neighborhood. Warren, thanks a lot, and Nate. We're gonna send you and your boys a set of this video. You can enjoy and enjoy watch us slugging along on those evil skeevers. And keep taking video every time you go for one of those P fifty one rides. I'm just totally impressed. That picture is hanging in my shop. Every day I get up and I say, Oh well, if I was Warren Walker, I'd be flying a P-51 or a B-25 today. Instead, I'm sanding a rudder. Let's get back down there and sand away. we got to clean this rudder up and see if we're going to be able to use it. Anyway, the reason I say may or may not want to use this is this is such a dominant feature to model, the V-tail, the high angle of dihedral, and how big this is relative to the thickness of the plane. I mean, it's, it's almost three times the width of the fuselage, unlike almost almost every other plane, where it's it's much thicker in the back and a much smaller rudder. So this is this part from here back is a dominating feature of the model. If we're going to make it look like an A26, and if we're not, well, we may as well just build a uh, you know a traditional plane. But anyway, here's my point. When I made this, I just guessed at the fact that because these surfaces looked about as thick as these surfaces on the model that I would start by making the total thickness, the stab and elevators, total thickness is a half inch, of course. I'd start with a 3 8 core, and these are a little bit thinner. But having looked at this, now when I'm finished with all the sanding and shaping and everything, I want it to look 
like these three surfaces are the same thickness. That's one of the appearance things that I want to key in on. Now Les had a plan for a very exotic way of building this with uh, ribs and a movable rudder and I didn't want to get involved in that because I don't want to have a lot of weight. I want this to be as light as possible in the back. One of the things that I know you can get very easily get carried away with with a scale model and in this one we're going to be putting a lot of material. There's a lot of paint material on a rudder this big. There's a lot of, well, there's a lot of material. The stab, the elevators are very far back relative to what they would be on a Cardinal. And at the same time, even though we've extended the nose, the nose is much shorter than if the motor were up here. You see what I'm saying? So we have to always be aware of not making the model tail heavy. That's a critical, critical mistake if you make this type of a semi-scale plane. And the enjoyment that I get out of any semi-scale project is seeing how scale or how true to scale I can make it and yet it'll still be relatively competitive in performance. Now, you know, you've got every step in between of making a plane where just the paint job is semi-scale or a plane where it truly is semi-scale, very scale, and maybe you've traded away a little too much and gotten the performance to where it isn't what you expected and everything in between. But we're going to really strive keeping this and this part of this plane, this part I would say from the wing back, I have spent a lot of time keeping it as light as possible, keeping as little finish on it as possible, keeping the material to a minimum, and yet it's still, because the fuselage part is carbon fiber, it's still relatively thick, so that's given us a little bit of a heads up, and now the thing is, we want to see how this rudder is going to look once it's all sanded and radiused off, and that's going to be the next step on this project. But there's even a final thing that I haven't even taken into account yet of what the rudder is going to do for us, it's going to accent maneuvers. There's going to be a lot of maneuvers where outside squares, triangles, whatever, where that's going to come around and hopefully lock in. And depending on what amount of trim and what lettering and inking and stars and bars and everything we put on it, it it'll add a tremendous amount to the overall impression of the plane. So having this rudder really look scale and really look right and not make the plane tail heavy and not be prone to warpage is going to be a tremendous challenge. And I know I've already decided in my mind that if I wasn't happy with the first or the second or the third one, I'd keep making them until I was happy. Because even if I have to make a spare one, it doesn't matter. This is a very easy part to make. And I want the weight to be light more than anything else because we're going to put so much, there's so many square inches here that it's going to absolutely, if, if we made this out of a solid piece of 3 8 a half inch wood and then put as much dope as it would take to make a nice finish, I just have a, a, a sinking feeling we'd be adding nose weight all over the place. So with all those criteria in mind, let me start sanding this part out. It's been drying overnight. The evil skeevers have been drying in my stomach overnight and we're ready to start cutting wood. Now it looks like this has dried relatively straight anyway and and again we we have so many criteria here and a part this big I, this this is probably the biggest rudder I've ever made if I were to try to make this in in maybe several other different ways adding a movable rudder a bunch of hinges I just have a sinking feeling I'd wind up with a tail heavy plane and I, I really have made a commitment early on to try to keep this part as light as possible. This is one of the parts that could either make or break the model, I think. And, and I want it, because it's a completely scale rudder too, it's not compromised in any way. It is exactly scale for that fuselage side view. It should be relatively authentic looking. And what I decided to do is, like I did on a B-25 and like several other people have done, is airbrush in all the details that would normally be on this. The B-25 does not have any movable rudders of any kind, but it has that airbrush work, and we're going to try to do something very similar to that, since I thought that was really effective, the way that worked out. The inking and the part of it that, uh, well, it simulates hinges and it simulates the, the three-dimensional look. I think we're going to be able to do that, replicate that on this model.
Now, of course, the Typhoon is a solid sheet rudder because these rudders are a lot smaller. I had just made them out of sheet balsa. I don't think a rudder made as big as the A26 would have to be made out of sheet would first of all be strong enough or it would be, it would look funny that it was so thin when the tail was so thick where it doesn't really look this bad on the Typhoon. Anyway, that all of that is airbrush work. The detailing, the riveting, and everything is all airbrush. So that's one of the things we're counting on to keep the tail light is the airbrush in the details instead of making the part heavier and heavier. And when you get good at airbrushing in details, one of the things that it allows you to do is make a very simple part and put the details in with airbrush. I remember Keith Trossel's Bearcat had exhaust pipes painted on the side and boy they look so realistic you had to reach up and touch them. It was just a great optical illusion and it allows you to keep the, the plane relatively simple and of course it adds a lot of detail. One of the details that airbrushed in well here that the cowl flaps really don't have those little gouges in them where they open. That's just ink work. But anyway, that's one of the little techniques we're going to try to use on this model. It's trying to keep that tail ultra, ultra light. So I really don't want to have to start putting nose weight in this plane if possible. And by the way, just for the record, the way the B25 trimmed out, we have never had to add, I, I have a little bolt and, a, and a, a pod up here that I can put nose weight in. Never ever had to add nose weight. Never ever had to add tail weight. It's It's been just... Uh, well, Dave Downey, I think, got it right right on the money, but one of the things that contributed to that was we have a super, super light tail going on. Both the rudders and the stab and elevators on this model are extremely light. And I think had I, when I made this model, had I made a plug for the B25 fuselage, I would already be dreaming about making uh, 30 seconds over Tokyo, one of the camo ones. But making that fuselage out of wood was just too much work and really too much wood to be honest. I don't have that much good wood. Definitely going to come up on a time very soon where we have two of these bombers and Les has come up with a little design to make the rack a double decker rack so the top would plug in and we can store both of them in the same area. I think that'll be handy although probably most of the summer one of them will be out in the truck whichever one we're flying. But it's really something I really look forward to the day, and it's going to be coming up very soon. And we're going to have two of these sitting side by side, maybe even at the flying field if we can get a, uh, a bigger vehicle to carry them down, and we can fly them back to back or have them both on display at contests. Just, just be a lot of fun. But anyway, we're going to take start by, and this will be pretty simple pulling out all the pins. By the way, pulling pins out, twist them and pull them out. That's the best way to do it, especially with aliphatic resin. Trim off all the edges, sand this out. Want to get a preliminary weight on it too, just get some idea of what this is going to weigh. Until you actually have this part in your hand, you don't realize how big it is. I mean, it's a, it's a large, go do this to a, uh, you know, a 60 size plane. There's a lot of square inches here, and keeping it light and straight is going to be a real challenge. Now, the first thing I want to do is trim off all the extra wood, get the edges straight. You can see up here I left plenty of wood as, as extra wood. We left plenty going around the outer edge. And a problem radius in the front of this off is I want to make it airfoiled, but I don't want to make it so thin that it gets flimsy because I know inevitably somebody's going to hold the plane when they launch it or something. I always have to take into account the uh, the wear and tear that goes into a model when you're hoping that it lasts forever in this case. In my case everything is lifetime because at 58 years old I'm not I'm not hoping 10 years from now I won't have this. I want to have this as Karen is so fond of saying until the day we die. Although I don't like to think about that day.
another handy tool is this big permagrit. Because we want to try to keep several of the angles and edges nice and straight. We even have the little one, which is nice and handy. Now the next step for me is I'm going to, I already have a, a center line down most of it. I want to get the rest of the center line down and then taper that front edge. What I did, because I went over to the model, and where this is going to mount on a model, it's a curved surface. And I really didn't have a bottom on this as such. So what I thought I'd do is I, I just put some center lines on so it wouldn't get on crooked. And this will be like the joining part so I can put a curve in it and it'll join right to the it'll join the fuselage to the rudder so I can leave that on that actually it'll stiffen it up too it'll make for a better joint there but having that on that's that's just going to be a little asset having that cap and of course there's no offset in this at all it's totally straight once I want to get in here and just just rough this in Actually, I should have done this when I made the rudder because I didn't, I didn't realize how much of a curve is on that fuselage. We're not mounting it to a flat surface. And a good way to make that joint is always to take the sandpaper and put a little piece of sandpaper right on the curve and then sand this in. It gives you just the same way you do a canopy. Anyway, I just got good news from Rich Jacobone, our fly -in, the new fly-in field. They finished putting up the fence. So the soccer players can't, uh, well, they, they will, but they can't come over and uh, run out into the field to chase their ball when we're flying over there. Anyway, I think that cap, that'll give me a nice joint, too, for where, where this is going to match. Chicky, who are you talking to? I want to rough in these edges. Chicky, who are you talking to? This is a nice trick you can use on trying to taper an edge. You take the big sanding bar, which is turp perfectly flat with the rough side up and just let about a sixty-fourth of an inch stick out over the edge. Then I can use the other bar. Now see what happens, I don't even need my other hand. The sandpaper holds it in position the same way a router table holds it and you can really work that edge down to where you have a fine line. And you really can keep it nice and straight, too. That's the other nice side benefit of this. Good trick. Once you have an edge that's really nice and straight and you're happy with it, I put a couple of coats. I already got one coat on there. Thick CA. Just let it sit there for a minute. No kicker, of course. What this is going to do is harden that edge up and, and hopefully prevent it from ever thinking about warping. Now carving this edge in, as we get into this 
the grain going the wrong way is going to really be annoying, but a good trick here is a sharp blade and just work it real slow to get that, that curve that you're looking for in there. Work off a center line. Now this part is going to get thinner and thinner, so we're just going to work off that center line one side at a time. Now see here we're running into that where the grain is directly in the wrong way, but we had to put a joint somewhere. Now right in here I can use that roll of sandpaper with the curve to get in there later. Now we can get a little bit of an idea what that curve is going to look like and how much we want to take off. It's just going to take a little bit of work to get this all sanded in and then of course once one side is done to get the mirror image of it on the other side. You can always vary the diameter of the sandpaper. Just put it on a bigger or smaller roll or tube or round a roll of wax paper or anything. That makes a real handy way of getting that curve and notice we're working right up to a center line. Just a real Easy way of getting a rough shaping. But half of this curve roughed in, what happens is we have a glue joint right here that's that always has a little hard spot no matter how we sand it. So it, we're going to do this anyway, so we may as well do this. We can just keep this whole edge nice and clean. What this does, it lets it all be hard now. Now it'll be much easier to do a final sanding. And since we have roughly half of this, we're going to run into a glue joint right here. Anytime you want to bury a glue joint, bury it in a hard area. And this will add a little durability, I think, to the model when we have a King Kong launching it or somebody holding it by the rudder or who knows. Now that just allows us to get a little bit better sanding and now we're going to do, we'll do this off camera, we're going to just repeat the same thing on the whole other side. And it's starting to shape up, starting to look like what I had envisioned. Once I get this all sanded out then we have to make up a little block for the top and hollow it out. finally managed to teach Chicky how to uh, turn the VCRs on and off while I'm gone. See, so he's going to change the channel. Look, he's looking inside. He thinks there's food in there. Chicky. Hey! Hey! Away from those VCRs. What a troublemaker. Anyway. That's all we're going to get done today. We got the rough shape. We need to make the top, hollow it out, and then do a final sanding and fitting on this. And then we'll bring it up to silver in the next couple of days. Great Ebel Skeeber day. Okay, a little time tonight. What I did, I picked up 
two pieces of scrap. I'm going to make this piece oversized, tack glue it together. Put it in place because I want to take it apart once it's off and hollow it out. Just to get, I'm going to get rid of this bird just to get rid of a little bit of extra weight. So the first thing is to tack it together and tack it in place. Well, that kind of sand it in real nice. Now we got to pull it apart and hollow it out. Even though it's just a little bit, we really don't want to have any weight on its tail that we don't have to because the moment arms are so different than a traditional stunt. Hey. You want to go flying today? You want to go flying. Now I just need to get a, uh, before I split the support, it's easier to do it this way. We definitely can get a little bit of weight out of here, a little bit of material. But before I do this, I wanted to make sure I had the outer shape, pretty much the shape I wanted to, so I don't have a lot of material left over in here. Now it's just a question of splitting this. Try not to break it, of course. Now I can take and just mark this. Hollow these two little pieces out and we'll be ready to put them back on permanently. Now even just a little detail, if I can get a little bit of, a little detail done here, a little detail there. There's also a little block I have to carve because the bottom of the rudder and the top of the fuselage are not an exact match. There's a little bit of a drop off in the back. I'm going to have to account for before I put the finisher on the rudder, I want to have that, that little block in place. So I have, once I get this top engineered up, carved out or whatever, then that'll be the next step. I can see the line. I can still get a little more off here. Usually right about now is when I break the part and have to glue it together. It's not a lot, but when you count how many times in the construction of a model you can just reach in and dig out some material, scallop out some part that is not going to add anything or just going along for the ride. You can feel there's still a bit more material up here. Now these parts are going to be ready to join back. You can see what happened. A little chunk came out at the top. That's going to be my little alignment key for lining these up. Piece of tape will hold that in place. So I just put a dot on this. That piece tacked in, make sure it's smooth all around. Put a glue seam on it, and now it's ready for what I hope is going to be uh, a final little sand out.
and then we'll make that little block up that goes under the back of the rudder and between the fuselage we'll figure out how we're going to do that because when I do finish the rudder I'd like to finish it and tissue it everything all in one piece and then attach it to the model that would be my first choice to get that sanded in I always like to harden that edge up with thin CA because this is one of the edges that's going to take a beating for sure once I get that on there and then just lightly just ever so lightly just sand it out to get the little the nibs off and now what I got to do next is bring that fuselage over and start measuring up to that little block that's going to go in there all these edges should be hardened up this is where people are going to be resting their hands and whatever now I have to get a little filler block I'm just trying to fit this in to see how big this has to be in fact what I'll do is make it oversized it looks like it needs to be about a quarter of an inch come maybe three inches in I'm just trying to get a rough idea of what this curve really is if I kind of exaggerate it it's going to go down that way and I'm guessing it's going to have to be about well we'll make it oversized to begin with Let's just get some idea of how this is going to fit. Of course, we have it oversized. We can bring this up just a little bit. And we're going to need a little bit of material out of here. We'll just have to do a little sheet rock fit here. Well, I think we got it close. Run a little bit out of here. We'll do it. <sighs> Trying to get a good fit because I want to get a good glue footprint when it comes time to install us, of course. That looks pretty decent. Next step is going to be, and we're at the end of the day anyway, a little spot, get a little bit of work done here, get a couple of coats of clear on this, and with the next day or so we'll be hopefully ready to tissue. And on the previous tape, we had a lot of the good tissueing information, silk span. Hope that's helping people. It's really important to understand just how much that silk span adds to a model in terms of strength. It's why when you build a plane and monocoat it, you it's still a, a serviceable plane, but it it's really difficult to get the rigidity unless you build it into the framework itself. Now I'm getting this wood good and good and soaked because I want to have a really, really good attachment 
for the tissue. I want this coat to sink right in. Again, I apologize for the last the last tape ending. I, I just get so excited working on the model that I, I forget to keep checking the tape toward the end to make sure we're not running out of uh, out of the tape medium. Anyway, usually I like to put three to five coats on. In this case, a little bit extra won't hurt for sure. Whatever extra comes up, it comes right up through the tissue as soon as you put the tissue on anyway. And these are windy coats, not Bob Brookins and I have two different kind of coats. Bob puts on Bob coats and Wendy puts on Wendy coats. Notice I'm going back over the spots where it's already sunken into the wood. I want one wet coat. I don't want this to warp either. You never would want to do one side and then let the other side stay dry. And I think we got a pretty good replication of what that rudder, and that rudder is one of the definitive, one of the things I really like about the model. Let's get that big rudder that it, it does have a unique look. It's a unique looking plane. If you look at all the, the World War II planes in some of the old books, it's it jumps right at you. It's a unique guy. Now, three or, three or four coats later, we're going to be ready to tissue this probably tomorrow. And that heat is cooking away. You can see the newspaper fluffing along here from the heat. I'll be ready to tissue in the morning. Oh, this looks like it dried up really nice. You can see the areas that we hardened up with the thick CA have a little bit more of a shine than the, the wood parts, but even the wood parts have a very, sh very slight sheen to them. Now, I've sanded this twice already in between coats, but I just want to show just about how much sanding we're talking about in between coats. Not talking about taking off all the dirt or bringing it down to raw wood. It's more of a defuzzing than a sanding. The part came out even lighter than I thought it would, so I guess we're in, in okay shape in terms of the weight. And when I held it up there, I haven't put the whole model together. It really does look the thickness does look just about right and that was something I was concerned with Dicky, who are you talking to? my god this bird it's springtime and he needs a mate if anybody out there has a female that needs a male now a couple of tricks at this point before we do the tissue and we're ready for the tissue and I would say that's about all the sanding we need to do here on a wood part. It's been sanded twice. We've got five coats of dope on it. Nice thick coats too. What I try to do, any part that's a built up part, is just gently squeeze it and see if you find any spots where it may be soft. Because if it is, you can double tissue it. See up here, I think the sheeting was getting just a little bit thin. See how dark it is? But it's not soft. And what that usually means is the CA has hardened up the wood. But if we find any soft spots, one of the tricks is just put in an extra piece of tissue. That'll harden it right up. In fact, up here now, it's still pretty good. Okay, so we're ready to cut tissue. Get this tissued up, and then we should be able to get the majority of the finish on it. Now. At this point in time, I have my little priority list of things I want to do. For instance, I need to make the flaps, the gas tanks, the landing gear. So 
anytime finishing material is dry, and I always start the day off by trying to get something drying. And while it's drying, go to my priority list, take the top thing on a list, and look for, well, what do we do on that in between coats? Because this up by the heating vent today, and for some reason it's brutally cold out there today, this will dry up in 20 minutes to a half hour. We'll give it an hour or so between coats. We should be able to get most of the tissue and finish on this today, though, and maybe even tomorrow get it installed. Because we want to get all the material ready, get the tissue cut. Hey, what are you doing over there? Oh, this bird is going to make me crazy today. I want to have all my material ready. And that is a good trick right at this point in time if you're doing especially some of the places that can be a problem. When you're doing a typical D tube wing, a lot of times the leading edge sheeting gets a little soft and it starts having those little, I call them starving horse looks. Well, one of the things you can always do at that point in time, just double tissue it. It's a good trick. Of course, it's a wood part. Windex is my first choice instead of water. Just dampen the tissue. We're trying to create that, what I talked about on a previous video, that rubber band effect where the tissue is actually in tension at all times. And as the dough shrinks, especially as time goes by, creates a very strong bond. Now one of the things I've seen people have trouble with, and it's, I guess everybody thinks if we just leave out coats of dope, the plane will be lighter. Well, there's, a, there's definitely a price to be paid for leaving out coats of dope. And we want to get plenty on here. And in a way, it's kind of good that it's really getting cold out there again, because that means the heat will be on more and more and more. This will dry up. And while this is drying, again, I have a priority list. You've seen my priority list in the past and how I try to prioritize the jobs that have to be done, but at this point in time, always having something that's ready to dry. And I guess if you live out in California, you just put it out in, outside in the parking lot or something or in a car. What I've seen a lot of people do on a hot day is just put it inside their car. Of course, your car might tend to stink after a while. But anyway, we are coming down a home stretch on having this guy. At least that we can put him up on his landing gear soon, the next couple of weeks, and, and look at him from a lot of different angles and holler at him. It really does get exciting. Hard to imagine what other people do that don't have this kind of an interest in life. What the, what challenges them? What motivates them? One wrinkle in a whole part here. And as I always do, just press that coat right down through. Again, it's that pressing, press everything right through. Now, another trick, and it's, it's, these are important little things. Any kind of a surface, a flying surface, wing, tail, rudder, stab, flap, especially flaps, I guess, as soon as you get one side done, flip it over and do the other side because you don't want, you don't want one side to be drying while the other side's wet. You want to have both sides drying at once if we're just going to rough trim this off right now. Flip this over. And within a few minutes, get the other side done.
always use a relatively new blade. Get the silk span trimmed. You could save the scraps if you wound up having a piece that you needed to double tissue. I don't see any right now, but if we find one that looks a little soft, we'll certainly not hesitate to double tissue it. Okay, now, same thing on the other side. Now, I heard from Les, and he's on the tail end of having a week of bronchitis. And I hope we're going to be able to uh, get together and start working on his plane soon. Boy, he's had his share of problems this year with his mom and with him. Health-related issues plague us all. That's why Karen and I have kind of become fanatics about taking care of our health. But even at that, it's you're still on a losing end most of the time. Anyway, once one side is done, you want to get the other side done right away. Get both sides wet, and whenever you put another coat of dope on one side, dope the other side also. Again, the advantage of the Windex is that it doesn't soak into the wood anywhere near as much as water would. Now some of these jobs, especially tissueing, it's really handy if you have that a second or even a third person around. But it's always good to have a routine for doing everything yourself. Now if I feel a soft spot here, I think I'll get a little layer of double tissue right on that. I didn't feel that before. See, that's another advantage of pressing pressing the tissue down because you can actually feel if there's a soft spot or a spot that isn't just yeah there is a soft spot right there no substitute for just pressing it down and i haven't had a real issue with tape peeling up paint in years knock on wood but that doesn't mean that it, once you relax and you, you, you forget the basic rules, it's always easy to have problems. Got a lump of something there. Lump of yeah, right there, there's a soft spot. Let me show that. And the whole idea here is to keep both sides wet and get both sides drying at the same time. That's, that's what we're striving to do. And whenever people really suffer from having a nice straight flap and all of a sudden at the end of the finishing it winds up being a pretzel, it's almost always that they let one side dry and then have a cup of coffee or whatever, but you want to get both sides wet, both sides dry at the same time. Now again, I did find a spot here. Let's get a little piece of scrap. Doesn't have to be fancy, that's for sure. And just to be safe, because this is a soft spot, I'm going to take and put the same thing on the other side, the same about the same amount of tissue. It'll help strengthen it too when this actually gets glued on, because that's where the stress riser will be, right at the edge. It'll always tend to want to break right at the edge. Wherever you have the double tissue, always add a little bit of extra dope. Make sure it goes down through. 
again my thought was I ought to do this on both sides since that was a potential problem I like to work off a towel by the way a towel seems to work well it lets the dough breathe without picking up any uh, well, any dirt or dust off the glass table this is just like an insurance thing I'm not so sure we need it on this side but it, it's definitely not going to hurt these are the kind of things that if you do, if you do them and you don't need them nothing bad happens now once this is done on both sides because it's a wood part this the secret to all this stuff there's just a million little tricks not secret secret is not the right word and being able to go, go, do good tissue work is so nice. It's such a nice part of modeling because it's neat and clean. It, it isn't a problem. At least it shouldn't be. Now, we have both sides on here. What's, what's the next trick so it doesn't warp up? Wet both sides with dope. And get them really wet. Don't fool around. So that while this coat is drying, This is wonder, wonder, little tips to make warp-free surfaces. Is get one side done. Now you see this side is still. I'm holding it up with my hand, just so it isn't sitting in the towel. Keep it wet. Now both sides being wet, they should in theory dry at the same time too. And we can put them up by the. Uh, we'll let this sit about 10 minutes and then put it up by the heating vent. While this is drying, we can get working on some of our other little projects around here. But now we can come back to it every hour or so, every hour, hour and a half, put another coat of dope on it. I would say we need about five coats all together. And then a, maybe a coat or two of silver filler. For insurance, I'm going to put a piece across here. This, this, even though it's not soft, it just has the look of that I've sanded it a little bit too thin. And it's really, uh, it's really not going to be a big deal to just have an extra little piece of tissue going across there. This is one of the tricks that Harold Price was excellent at this. He would do it with Jap tissue. Now, I don't use Jap tissue, but he would just run around making little, little patches because his blocks were so light and he had everything sanded so thin. And the result was just, when you were done, incredibly light and never a spot where you saw that ripple in the wood. He was a master of that. All right, time to put this aside to dry. So and it's always a good idea to start the day off by getting something ready to dry. That's always, people that have trouble making a reasonable uh, production schedule, if that's the right word, or time. They, it always seems like they, they, they gear things around that, that nothing's drying. And at this point in time, with the model, we want something drying all the time. And both sides are wet. Both sides should be drying at the same time now. That, he, that heating vent is certainly our friend. Hey, you're not my friend. Get away from that part. While that's sitting up there drying, that's going to be drying for the next hour or so. We can get other projects done around the shop. One on this next little part of this project, we're going to try to lay out the flaps. I want to get very carefully now, get off all of the, the paint that's accumulated on the horn wires. Reason is that'll make, we're going to make lucky boxes in here and I don't want to have them fill up with paint residue or paint chips or whatever these you want to call these. I also want to make sure I don't have any sharp edges. Let me get my... Well, it's going to be a lucky box. I don't want to have any kind of a, a razor edge on anything. It won't matter out on the end by the nacelles because we'll just have the, the flap set in the normal way.
See, what's going to happen, while well, these are in a lucky box, this is going to be sliding back and forth. I don't want it to wear a groove. Now we've got a really limited amount of clearance. When you line up the fuselage side, well, we're going to put the model together soon. We're really going to have to get the lucky box right in the edge of the flap because I, I want to have the flap, the part that's making lift, as close to the body as possible and trap that air in between the nacelles. I think that's one of the things that works really well on a B-25. And what happens as the flaps go up, see how close that is to the fuselage? I want to get it as close as I can in both of the, when it's in the down position and in the up position, both. Trapping that air in there, I think, is it's, it can't be a bad thing, that's for sure. I want to have as close of a fit on that as I possibly can. In the case of the nacelles, we don't have a choice because as it goes down, the nacelles are bigger on the bottom of the wing than the top, so we have to take that into account when we lay that out. And actually laying out the the flaps themselves is a relatively complex thing. This is not going to be like making a normal set of flaps where in 20 minutes you have them made. I have to engineer in a lucky box and this right up by the fuselage side, a tube, a tube, and then the last thing is get the right curve on the wingtip, the wingtip part of it. So it'll be relatively complex. And everything on this plane is complex and, and it's the complexity that makes it worthwhile. It makes it a challenge, makes it exciting. And when I'm up, when I get up in the morning like this, it just gives me something real, that I'm really excited about to be working on. So let me finish cleaning up these horns and then we'll assemble a model and start laying out these flap parts. Now as I'm going along, as I always do, I constantly am picking up little spots that I think I could make a little smoother, a little dense. And these happen because what happens with these wires, they slide back and forth until I get the flaps on permanently. And they wind up getting pressed all the way around and putting a dent in the trailing edge, something I didn't account for. I have to just be aware of that. Got everything cleaned up now and I'm ready to start laying out the first part of the flap. But what's convenient about this now is I can just go over, put another coat of dope on. We've gone about an hour into this. Get another coat of dope up on the tail, then after two coats it'll be ready to sand. Once I get it sanded, another hour goes by, and we'll get another coat on. So by later this afternoon, we should be ready to hopefully get some filler on there. The double tissue is just the slightest little bit of sanding to break that edge. In between coats, it's always a good idea. Just, I call it, taking a fuzz off. I don't want to sand through, I don't want to take down. Anything but maybe the edge or any little high spots that are on here. And this will be ready for another brushed on coat. Three to five coats. If you put them on thin, you probably have to put five. If you put them on thick, probably three will do. It's only a matter of time before I break this, I know. It's, it's very delicate. But now where the joint is, I'll just put a little bit of extra dusting in there. This is where it pays to have those edges hardened with thick CA. It just allows, especially the trailing edge here where it's razor thin, allows you to get a real nice edge. I think that rudder is really going to look nice once we get that installed. ready to start laying out the flaps and lucky boxes. What I, what I had planned to do is start in by the root because getting that flap in place is going to lock that wire in place which is then going to set the, the dimension that that flap is. I'll make it oversized and then sand it in at the very end. So it'll mean making up the two middle flaps as the first priority and the first part of this whole job is we have to figure out how much how much sweep the lucky boxes are going to need. Now this is this is really a test. I just made up a, a piece of scrap wood here because I need to estimate this is as far as the control goes in this dimension. So let me just make this. This would be the dimension of the lucky box. 
Now what happens is, as this sweeps up, As this goes up through its travel, it moves quite a bit. And it looks like it moves about, oh, maybe a sixteenth of an inch through its travel. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make up a lucky box, a fake lucky box, just about it with an eighth of an inch of extra clearance in it. And that's got to get set into the end of my flap. We can make our lucky boxes up out of scrap, but first I have to make a little test part. The idea of this, what happens is as this flap is traveling up and down, this arm is going to move in and out, and in this case it's only about a sixteenth of an inch. So this, the first thing you, you don't want to do is make a lucky box an inch wide because it just makes it weaker and heavier. So we only have to allow maybe an extra, at most, an eighth of an inch. So, the easiest way I know to do this is start with just scraps and lay out what amounts to be a little prototype box to see how thick that little arm is going to be. We, we need to get a nice tight fit so that arm can slide back and forth as this is moving up and down. And the trick is to make the box as small as possible and still have room in a perfect world that, that would just go from one end of the box to the other and not have any clearance, but that's unrealistic. We're not making a machine shop job. If I make it an extra eighth of an inch, that'll be plenty. We want to have all the grain going in the direction of the wire, all the primary grains of the wood. So let me start laying this out. We'll see how it looks like. I'm going to need three inches, a little over an inch in each piece. It will make these a little longer than they have to be. And I'm going to try to use this because a piece of basswood here. But again, all scraps. You don't have to use any good material here. I can lay this out. I know I need three inches of material. I know I need the piece to be a little more than an eighth of an inch wide, the little slot. And that, that's going to be plenty. And a little bit extra. I would say it doesn't pay to try to make it really too tight. Now, the next thing is I have the basswood. I'm going to strip off the basswood. Cut up two pieces of basswood here. Strip it down the middle. Now, the part that I didn't strip, let's see, this is the smooth part. We can put that toward the inside and just let this kick off. You could also use eighth inch ply. The reason for doing this is I want to make a little test because if this is a little on the plus side, and again we don't know if it is, if this is on the plus side I want this wire to be a tight fit in here. Both pieces on there. Now I just need to check this is kind of a little test to see what the fit is like. And if it's too thick, what I'll have to do is just sand that down a little bit. Oh, that's a nice tight fit. That's fine. So we can use that thickness now. Now all I need to do is strip off another piece of scrap. You can do that off here. Again, the idea is to keep the, the lucky boxes as thin as possible, not any thicker. In fact, we're going to sand a lot of that material away. It's always easier, just like gear blocks, if you make them both up at the same time. It looks like basswood is going to be a good choice. It's a good fit for the wire, anyway. Now you can see what we have ultimately here. We have an ability now, you get that piece of wire, the ability of that wire, when it's confined in there, it can move back and forth a, a given amount with the flap rotation. So the next thing I need to do now is just grind this down on a belt sander, get it all even, and then determine the length. I need to keep 
one side as thin as possible, the side that faces the fuselage, because we don't have a lot of clearance here. The other side I'll leave about an eighth of an inch. Okay, now the thin side is going to go up against the fuselage side, so I can cut this right in half. And the next thing I'll be to, to lay this on the horn and see that we have enough clearance. The trick is, of course, that this doesn't have any slop in it at all, which it doesn't. It's, it's pretty good with the spruce, with the basswood, I mean. But I just want to, I'm a little concerned that 64th plywood might uh, not be strong enough, so I'm going to double up a layer of 64th plywood on here, just as an insurance. This will have plenty of room inside the flap. It's not an issue. And again, all the grain going in one direction, all in the direction of the flap. Now I just feel a little bit safer about having an extra piece of plywood. Again, these flaps at the root are four and a half inches. So we really don't, uh, I don't want to have something that's not going to stand the test of time here. As soon as I get these boxes finished, then the next step, in fact, I'm running out of time here tonight. Next step is going to be to lay out the flaps themselves. And we may have to wait till tomorrow to do that. That may be, I don't want to rush any part of this. And I can get another couple of coats of clear on that rudder, get that prepped. So that's probably what we'll do is we'll finish up the lucky boxes, be ready to install these tomorrow. I feel a lot better with the double plywood. I'm not sure why. Four and a half inch flaps. I really don't want to compromise any of that strength if I don't have to. Two little pieces of 64th plywood. Anyway, these are rock. These are rock solid now. Now what I'm going to do is spend the rest of the night going through my wood trying to find some decent pieces of wood and cutting out the blanks that are going to be the flaps. These will then be the pieces that have to get inset into the end of the flap and before we do anything make sure we have a full range of motion where these are not interfering in any way. But that's the kind of thing that's better off, you're better off really letting that go for uh, when you have a good amount of time early in the morning and some coffee because there's always a lot of fitting going on on that. So we'll see you in the morning. Well, tonight I caught a little bit of a little bit of a break here. Karen wanted to go shopping and they didn't need me, that's for sure. So what I did, I was going to do this tomorrow morning, but I, I had some time tonight to work on it. I got all the pieces just shaped out. Now the most important thing with this whole operation was I wanted to keep the grain going with the trailing edge, not not the hinge line. Grain going with the trailing edge. So I roughed out all these parts. Because they're so big, even a four inch wood needs a piece out on the end. I took the heaviest one, made sure I marked the heavy one as the outer one. Now what this will do, it gets me an hour or so ahead tomorrow morning, and now that I have to do the boxes and I need to, I could actually probably get another coat of clear on that tonight, but anytime, here's the point, anytime I have a little break in the action, and I didn't expect to be able to have this time tonight, but rather than just watch TV or uh, you know, whatever else people typically do, what, I, what I'm able to do is get a little bit ahead on tomorrow's work. And this way, if tomorrow becomes a busy day phone-wise, too, that uh, I'm just way ahead of the game. And I'm looking forward to now, it'll give me something to think about, looking forward to getting these flaps installed, get the hinge pockets cut tomorrow. This should be a busy day tomorrow. And it looks like we got a nice little head start on it. doesn't matter what design you make or what ship, the, the grain should always go parallel to the trailing edge, not the hinge line. That's one easy way, even if you don't have real sea grain wood, to keep your flaps straight and keep them from warping. 
Now in this case, because these are so the cantilevered and everything, this was really difficult to do, but it, still, keeping the grain parallel to the trailing edge. So if you have to add a piece, you add it up in here. And then just block sand down that edge to be straight, but never put the grain, put the part of the wood that you get cut right up along the trailing edge. When you get it, you always want to have the part that you get cut from the factory part of the trailing edge. And that is that is one of the best tips to keep your flap straight. That if you don't do that, you're really stacking the deck against yourself for no reason at all. There's no saving by doing it the other way. Flaps like this that are built up, it's still better to have the grain, the edge that's cut from the factory, which is usually the grain that's most parallel, have that on the trailing edge and the grain that you're going to cut, the edge, be the part that's against the wing. And that's, again, one of the things that separates really good models from so-so models that are always needing tweaks and different different things that just get to be a pain when you're trimming out the plane. Now every once in a while I just get blown away. I can't even tell you. This is the kind of stuff that makes doing what I do and, and obviously what you do worthwhile. This is from a, a guy I've never met. His name is Ferenic Zimboli. C-A-M-O L-Y-I. Now, I just want to read this letter. Well, let me get the phone first. I want to read this letter real quickly. This is unbelievable. Very impressive stuff. That was Mike Costello giving me the results of VSC. Well, right now we don't have time to do VSC, but we'll be writing it down and passing on as soon as he gives me the pictures, if he has any. Anyway, here's some, again, this, this is pretty incredible stuff. And, I, and I'll read right from the guy's letter. In case you find my, find my name strange for a Brazilian, this gentleman lives in Brazil. I was born in Hungary in 1942, came to Brazil with my parents in 1949. I'm a Brazilian citizen. My father was an aeronautical engineer back in the old country. I inherited a taste for aviation. By the way, you've met a friend of mine, Ro Roberto Machado. He's a clubmate. Now that's how he knows about me, I guess. And obviously they're watching a lot of, I uh, no sense going on and on. They're watching a lot of videos down in Brazil, and they know that I'm making a an A26. So from our Brazilian friends, this guy sends, like, the most incredible collection of stuff. i got to back this up a little bit. Now, I could see if he copied one or two pages of a magazine or something, but what he did to me is, is way above. In fact, it was almost $4 to mail us from Rio de Janeiro. But it has some things about the invader. I love that the long pointy nose. Some things about the invader that we're, we've added to our. Uh, gee, I should have told Mike I got all this extra data while we're on the phone. Some different paint jobs. And where do you see what's at the end of this? And you never have too much information. Different nose art. And we're going to have to think about that. Different canopy configurations. And this is from a magazine called Air Enthusiast. I've never seen it or heard of it. It just goes on and on and on about things they did with the with the A26 and it's the life of the plane. I started reading this real quickly and I, I thought maybe I could just skim it. It's it's way too good of an article to skim. This is the version that had four bladed props and the jet engine. They they pretty much covered all the variants in the back. This is what I really wanted to see when we we're going to do the inking very soon. This is going to be a giant help as far as the inking goes. We'll know where a lot of the panel lines are. Always good to have that when you're going to do an ink job. Now imagine a guy from Brazil that I've never met. I, we've never even talked on a phone. We've never even emailed. And we wind up getting this kind of information. Now just look at what happened here in the course of the A26. I'm sure guys like Walt Brownell know about this, but they became transports, they became privately owned planes, different variants. And by the way, Walt, as an A26 owner, the owner's club, if you're interested in any of this, actually if anybody's interested in this, as soon as we're done inking a plane, I'll be glad to pass this along to anybody. Um, you know, obviously I'd like to have it back at some point in time, but 
some really, really interesting information. Now, at the end of it, it shows some A-26s that were in the Brazilian Air Force. Now, how cool is that? See, I never even knew that. I never knew for one minute, and I'll have to go over this. See, because I don't watch a lot of television, I have plenty of time to do this. Now, of course, I don't speak Spanish. About 30 invaders were used by the Brazilian Air Force, making it the third largest operator of this plane behind the USA and France. Now, I didn't even know that. But look at this. From, from, look at the, look at the insignia from the, the Brazilian Air Force. It's kind of a cool star. Now, if, if you were looking for some kind of wild paint job to do that, that certainly would be one of them. But it's just what we do is so, Hey, by the way, there's some nice nose art there. What, what we do tends to make us a band of brothers. There's the, there's the, look at the stars, the little tweak in the stars. It makes us like a band of brothers, and, and I like how this is white on one side, dark on the other side. So many cool things. When you get involved in a semi-scale project and start doing the research and start doing the homework, you find out there's so much more than just building a model. The model is really only a part of it. And then when you link up with guys like here we are from Rio de Janeiro, you link up with interesting people like this, it just makes it so much nicer. Anyway, from our friend, and I'll, Ferenek. Ferenek, what a name. I bet he thinks Wendy is a common name. Anyway, thank you very much. We'll get you a copy of the video, of course. And thank you very much. And keep looking at those windy videos down there in Rio. Quite interesting stuff. Now today, what I want to do is the first thing, before anything else, see if we have enough dope on here, and apparently we do. If you can see the little bit of a shine on there, I fixed a little spot here. I, I think I put my phone. <laughs> It was a soft spot, I was holding it there. Now, once I get to this point, I still want to scuff this up with some 320 paper. I just want to scuff it up. And this is ready for the first coat of silver filler. It's going to be silver with talc. I will spray one coat of that on this morning. First thing, and the advantage of doing it that way is then we'll put this up by the heating vent later today. It may be dry and we can get working on the coats of silver. Now that's about all the sanding I would need to do on it. Just to scuff it up, get any little rough spots off. Make sure it has that little bit of that little bit of shine. And once it's got a little bit of shine, you're really ready to put on the first coat of silver filler. Really <coughs> cold and windy out here, so. <coughs> This is silver and it has the usual amount of talc in it. And what's nice is when I hold this up to the sun, it's kind of like you can look right through it even. I'm going to put plenty on because we're going to sand this off. This is definitely going to be a filler coat, so I as well just put it right on. Fool around with it. And already I can see things that, that are going to need attention. There's some flaws down here. Flaws up at the top.
When you spray the filler like this, obviously you save yourself a lot of sanding. That'll sit up by the heating vent. We'll put our red filler on as soon as uh, it's dry to the touch. I want to come back here and work on these flaps. But after being outside for 10-15 minutes, I need a cup of coffee. It is really brutal out there. Now because we prefab these parts up last night, we're a little bit ahead now. This is the overall part and what I have to figure out here I'm going to inset this into the edge with the thin edge. And let's just see if this is going to work the way I think it is. Are we parallel here? Yeah, we sure are. Okay. Let's see with the thin edge against it. Still have to make sure, yeah, we're going to have enough room. We have enough wiggle. First thing I have to do is relieve a little bit of this so that this can fit further up onto the horn. But otherwise what happens is this will be sitting back an eighth of an inch from the front of the horn and we don't want that. I just need to notch that out with the Dremel tool. Okay, now you can see with that, oh, that's going to allow that to go much further up onto the flap, which is what we want. Now we also have to take into account the fact that we're going to have an angle on the front of this. And I just want to make sure we don't get too cute. We can only go to within maybe a sixteenth of the front. So the next step is going to be to cut out this little piece of the flap, mark this out, and then tack glue it in. Just tack glue it in. Now you're thinking, well, we don't have a lot of extra wiggle room here. We're going to have to cover this with something. But it'll be just easier. I've thought of trying to hollow this out. Well, I don't like that idea. The problem with hollowing it out is it's just going to get too flimsy. So I'm just going to cut this off. And when I'm done, just splice another piece of wood right on top of it. Now we got that little piece on there. Let's see if... next thing I have to set in here, before I can get too creative and fancy, I have to figure out how far out the tube is going to be. Let me just get this underneath. Let's make sure we don't have tension on the horn. And how far the, ho the tube is going to be. I need to mark this here, because we're going to have to inset the tube. Now this side doesn't need a lucky box, this is a straight line. Let's just see if we try to get this kind of even. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to grind out the wood in there so that the tube actually fits inside there. And then one is going to line the other one up. Now we just need to do a preliminary fit here. The tube is going to set right in here and probably split the wood. I really made it a little bit too tight. I ought to make this a little bit sloppy. I needed to have a sloppy fit because this I want to get this to this side here. When the hinge line is lined up, that this will fit this angle exactly right. So let me open this up just a little bit more so we have a little slop in there. And then we'll fill it with glue. Now the reason we want to have this even stronger than it has to be, because if we're going to do any flap tweaks, we'll do them out here. We only need to twe tweak that outer little piece. So let's see if we have a good fit here now. Looks like we're going to have to take some more material off. Well, let's just see. It'll be interesting to see if I force this. 
probably going to split the wood. Anyway, let me see if I can get this on here. Now, i got to make a little more clearance on the tube. The tube is longer. Ah, look at this. All right, so I know I need to make it longer. It left an imprint in there anyway. This can get glued right back. If at first you don't succeed, try again. Get, need a little bit more clearance. And we break it again. Okay, but we know where that tube should be now. So rather than fooling around, we can put, let's glue this back together for the 12th time. And then just put one drop of glue on that and see if we can set the tube. See, I want that rod to actually set the tube. It seemed to work as I hardened this whole area with thin CA. Just whoops, so that is still sticky. As soon as this dries, I'm going to just put that tube in with one drop of glue so I can set. I want that rod to actually set this in place. Next step is to put that little relief, a little cut in there, so this can go on the, the flap horn all the way, otherwise it can't go past the bend. You need that little bologna slice out of there. That's what I'd do even if I were just making a non-take-apart plane, but I wanted to have the flaps off until it was all buffed out and then glue the hinges in. Now I'm going to pull this off nice and slow, hopefully hold that tube right in place, and put some thin CA on it. A couple of drops, just to hold that in place. I've got a couple of just pieces of scrap to hold that tube in, and I'll sand this all off nice and even, and I'm ready to put the hinge line, that little angle on the hinge line, that'll allow me to get the full throw and see if I have any interference anywhere. Taking a little piece of scrap, going over these boxes so I can sand this whole flap. I'm keeping them flat. I need. I don't want to put any of the taper until all the flaps are made, because I may have to adjust something here, a little bit on a trailing edge, for instance, if they didn't line up just right. But and then when they're all done, I want to have them all in place, and then finalize one with a ruler, one trailing edge, and a, a nice even line, and then I'll put the taper in. The way we always have in the past, put on our angled flap, lay a piece of tape, in this case it's eighth inch, lay a second piece of tape out, pull this out, now we're going to carve right up to that line. Of course, I'm going to grind this with the with the Dremel. That's that's hard material there. I can carve and sand from the center line. And we, again, we have to grind that. And this should let me get a good final fit on this. And that's what I'm looking for right now. I want to make sure I don't have any interference, any clearance issues. I always have to grind a corner out of that part. And if you, if you basically sand from the tape, and end at the center line. I love you too, Chicky. But I still don't know who you're talking to. Let me just 
block sand that corner right off. That gives you half an edge. Now we'll flip it over to the other side and then we're ready to do our test fitting. The thing is to glue a little edge in here. And this is going to need a little bit of a taper. So I'm trying to get a nice, a nice even fit between the body and the flap. So I need some soft material to work with. Now with this fit in place, you can see the problem we have is we have a clearance here. But of course, before because the porn spreads when it goes down, that's not a problem. It's only in the up position. So we need to take about another, wow, about a sixteenth off of that. Now it looks like we have no interference here so far. And there's definitely no binding in the lucky boxes. Whoops. So now I, what I can do, I want to set two hinges in here. I want to set two hinges and cut the two hinge pockets. I have a tool to cut hinge pockets. Cut the two hinges in there just to make sure we have a final fit. Once I finish that side, then I want to do the other side. I want it to hopefully be exactly equal when I'm done. And then I'm going to move out to making the outer flaps. And then, of course, the last thing is going to be the fillets, which is really going to be time consuming. And I doubt that we're going to be able to get a fillet in there. If, if anything, we're going to get the world's smallest fillet. But we do have what I really wanted more than anything else was that I have, let's, let's look at this real close, real tight. And that hopefully will trap air in there, create some lift, some free lift anyway, because don't forget we lose all this wing area. You know, this is an 800 inch wing, it's really a 660 inch wing when you take out the nacelles and a 4 inch wide fuselage, so. Now, of course, we got our little hinge, hinge pocket tool for the IM hinges. I want to make sure I have enough clearance, maybe an eighth of an inch. That puts our little hinge pocket in. Now we just need to get a knife, slip that and with the hinges in place. And we got the clearance set where we're going to be happy with it. And hopefully happy with it. Now it's just a question of, and I'm trying to do this, this methodically, probably won't have enough time to, to do the other one today, but that's going to be the next step when we'll probably we'll just wind up doing it off camera because we also want to let I also want to let that rudder dry at least one day before we sand it out that's coming up on being finished that will just require a sand out so I guess what we'll do tomorrow is just get this other one done off camera and then we could start working on the outer flaps that looks like that would be the most productive use of time right now On today's session, we got a complete replication. We got the clearances very equal on both sides, and very, very close on and believe it or not, this was a whole day's work. Getting these two guys and getting the replication, actually two days of work. But the outer flaps, all we're going to have to deal with is the one horn. We'll make those up the next session we get, but right now we got a couple other little projects to work on here. Now this morning, the first thing, as I always want to do, is get something drying. It looks like th this is totally dried up. It's been sitting up by the heating vent. So what I'll do is work on all the little areas and when I put some of this material on here it's always to to tell me to just take a little sanding block and find the high or low spot or just sand until everything disappears and you know you've got that 
that done. Now, what's underneath here is the silver talc, so a little bit of that is going to stay on. You can see how nice that silver talc fills in. One of the nicer things, because it's sprayed on, don't have any brush marks to sand out, which if you brush fill it, that, that can be a problem. As long as we sand until all of these little areas go away, then the rest of this I can just sand. I know I've got some of the some of the areas that I was concerned with taken care of. But that's what the silver does. The silver, see the little spots it's all filled in? You hardly see them, but when you're striving to have something as nice as it can be, sometimes you just have to pay the price with the extra sanding, the extra hours, the extra coats. Anyway, we want to leave on just enough of the filler, and the next thing we'll do is put on a coat of silver without talc in it. And if you have two guns, this is a good time to have one with the silver talc and one without talc. And you can go back and forth if you have to fill in a little area. Now the rest of this can just be sanded the traditional way. And I want to leave just enough fill and talc on there that hopefully, you know, then we'll get a coat of silver, sand that down, and maybe be ready for the last coat in the next day or two and get this installed. Now this part looks ready for what amounts to be a coat of silver. You can see how the little silver filler stays in all those spots. One thing's for sure, it's going to need more than one coat, but there's no point putting another coat of filler on. The, the, the silver without the filler will sand just as well, if not easier. So I'm going to run out there in the freezing cold. Boy, we have hit the worst weather. Gee, it was so nice for a while, and now it's freezing. Hey, get a coat of silver on this, and then we can proceed with the day's work. Oh man, I, I am definitely moving to sunny Southern California here. Now this is just silver, ordinary silver. 50-50 with thinner. We can put plenty on since we know we're going to sand this off. When you know you're going to put the last coat on and it's all nice and smooth, then you put on a nice thin coat. But right now we can put on what Bob Brookins affectionately calls a windy coat. get this curved area up in the front. Kind of a focal point. Okay, there we are. That's going to dry while we're doing the rest of the work on the wing. And I hope we can start working on the flaps while that's drying. I start roughing out these flaps. I want to get this relatively in neutral. There's one, one criteria for these flaps. Of course, I've weighed the heavy one. Put the heavy one on the outside. The light one on the inside. What I want to do is I want to measure up. All I have to do is sink the tube for the horn in here. And I've made these short enough that I can add a splice in here and I want the tip, the grain on the tip, to be going in this direction. I've tried making flaps where you're, you're sanding the end grain and it's a radius. and It's never as good as if you have the end piece 
with the grain going front to back. So I've made them short enough. Remember, the primary grain, the grain that comes from the factory, goes along the trailing edge. So I can lay this out and mark nice, nice, and mark where the horn is going to go. All I need to do is inset the tube in this. I've got the little notch in there. I can cut a piece of tubing. Cut the end to relieve it for the horn. I have the little fish, they call it the fish cut. Give me some clearance. Make sure there isn't any paint on this horn, which there seems this has to be a pretty free, free and easy. There's a little burr on there. Uh, if you have a burr, of course, the only choice you have, is make sure there isn't any paint on the wire. That's okay. There we go, right on. Now I know that's how far that's going to have to go into the flap. I still have to cut a little bit of material away here. leave that just a little bit more because what I want to do is I want to get a set on this. Once I have that set, then I can pinch this. Just make sure I'm straight, perfectly straight. Pinch this. And now that tube is in exactly the right position. I can CA it right in place. That's a good way to get the tube lined up. Since it's tacked in place, what I like to do is just do a test fit, make sure I don't have it crooked or that it's binding in some way. In this case, it could go out just a little bit. Okay, now I can put a permanent glue joint and fill that in with a block and cap this off with a piece of eighth inch. The next thing I can do is just take a little piece of scrap. This doesn't have to be too fancy, it's just acting like a filler. Press that in place. Okay, as soon as that kicks off, we'll sand that nice and smooth, and we've got our tube installed. You just have to put a cap, I like to put a, like an eighth inch cap here. That, what that does, it gives me a little room when I'm making a fillet. I want to have a soft edge until the fillets are done. But now we have a removable flap. Okay, that's ready for the eighth inch cap. Now every once in a while, some CA will get down in here. By the way, you have to back cut that little piece of wood out of there. Now what I do, never put this in a drill press that's running. Take a drill and just drill in there by hand. Or with a hand, a tap handle. And the biggest mistake, if you run a running drill in there, it'll catch on the tube and tear the whole end of the flap out. What we have to do now is trim off the edge of that, sand it even. We have our little horn pocket, the wire lined up. Now again, I only wanted this block in this, with the grain going this dimension so I could get a nice even sand out here. Otherwise, it's really a problem. This end grain never wants to take a nice curve. Now we've got this flap roughed out. The only thing left to do, and we'll do it off camera, is same way. We'll tape off the front, carve in the hinge line, put in the hinge pockets, and we'll be ready to install this flap at least tonight. Well, I had, I had illusions of finishing both flaps today. <coughs> Not really going to happen. But I did get, and this is this is the first time we've we've got a clicker of a hinge here. Click. Got to find out which hinge is clicking. 
Now I was just happy that we got this much done because once this flap is done the woodwork on the plane will basically be done and that's probably another day for a flap another day to trim it all out see I don't, they're still square I don't have the, the taper in them I don't have the exact I'm going to do that with a, a ruler get that line just right when you're making multiple flaps like this it really tends to be uh, a lot more work than you think it is but anyway we're going to come back to this tomorrow one more flap well as we close in on this it just gets more and more exciting and the day is coming where we're going to have both of these guys sitting out in the driveway or at the flying field or somewhere that will be uh, as we affectionately call it bomber command you sure don't want to have is what happened on the last tape that we're in the middle of a tape and <laughs> all of a sudden whoop, the tape runs out so what I decided to do, Wes is supposed to come over tomorrow. He's been sick for a while. Now we're going to work on his flaps too, so we'll pick this up. We'll end this. Basically the other flap is going to be redundant to this flap anyway. And pick up and see what we can make of uh, what's happening, you know, with Wes's plane. He's had some delays, but he's still, we're still hoping we're going to have it ready for this flying season. Now as always, I hope you'll share these tapes. Spread them around. Spread the good news around. We're going to be doing a, very soon, a full Brodak dope finish with B25 silver. That's going to be something coming up on one of the next subscriber tapes. But most of all, I hope you just enjoy sharing them and enjoy watching them over and over again in the shop while you're building. That's what we do here. I don't even know if we'd be able to build planes without... Uh, being inspired or reminded of the summer that's hopefully coming and we sure don't have anything like summer right now in fact we are just freezing but our silver is drying up boy that silver just sitting up by the heating vent drying away up there some of this silver still needs to be touched up and we're coming up on really having this guy in one piece it's going to be pretty exciting this is when hundreds of hours of work all start to be worthwhile and you're you wonder what the people do that don't build models you know they spend 600 hours watching Oprah or watching some television or something that I count not as challenging and not as interesting and not even as much fun as model aviation all aspects of model aviation and we'll see you on the next tape